Welcome to For Fox Sake, where we give zero fucks about money shame and talk about real life and finance, including the taboo behind it all. So grab your Monday morning caffeine and let's chat. Good morning, Fox Den. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I hope you have a calm week ahead. Uh, That is my hope for you. I hope Monday goes quickly. Today, we are going to be talking about Sober October, uh, an update on my sobriety, and then we have a few listener questions that I'm going to be answering. So should be a pretty low-key day. I thought that would be fun after all the facts I threw at you during the pay transparency episode, which was episode number eight. So let's go ahead and get into it. For those of you who are new here, I decided on August 28th that I needed to stop drinking. Um, I have an entire episode about that, which I'll link in the show notes. It's a very heavy episode, but it kind of just takes you why I made that decision for myself. I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. But every year in the sober community, there is Sober October. Um, And it's just a time when we encourage people who maybe are sober curious or who need a break from drinking um, or who are continuing sobriety to take a break from alcohol or I guess any substance that you need to take a a break from. So my Sober October, it's my first one in complete sobriety. And um. I'm finding it very interesting, to be honest. There's a lot of duality in sobriety, um, and I am on day 50 as of this recording when this goes out, I believe, or maybe 49. I'm I'm around that big 50 milestone. (laughs) Um, A lot of duality, like sobriety is both easy and complex. Uh, Not drinking is a, a quick and easy decision I can make, and I can put barriers in front of myself and block myself from drinking. But also the cravings and the times when I'm around people are especially difficult. Like people like we went out to the Eras tour because if you don't know, I'm a huge Swifty. And we went to Fuzzy's Tacos, which has margaritas the size of my head. And I love margaritas and Mexican food because I am a basic white bitch. (laughs) So seeing that was really hard, but I had already made my decision. And I think that's what's really different for me in this point in my life. I have made the decision to not drink and that is unwavering. I will not drink. And I think that resolve is what's gotten me through the 50 days of not having alcohol. Um, but it is it's it's interesting. I've learned a lot about the body and the brain and how ethanol, which is alcohol, <laughs> affects it. I notice things that I I didn't notice before. Um, Hanging out with certain people is a little more difficult just because they are consuming substances and, uh, you know, the drunker they get, the weirder and the more out of place I feel. Um, So it's been it's been interesting and I've really enjoyed Quitlet. Um, The one that I have read recently and my first one that I read, I'm taking a break. I'm reading a hockey romance or more mostly smut. Let's just be honest. Um, But the the first Quitlet that I read was Quit Like a Woman by Holly Whitaker. And that book was really well done. Some of it is problematic. um, And I think you need to take a critical approach to the author and her background and who she is to kind of look at it in that lens. But I will be recommending it to everybody. And in fact, I already have recommended it to four or five different people. So definitely enjoying learning more about this new phase of my life. And I think being so public about it has also been a blessing. Um, A friend from high school reached out to me. They recently hit a rock bottom and they told me, hey, I've seen you post about this and I think I need to do it as well. And we have been messaging back and forth um, since they reached out to me. And it's been it's been really nice to have somebody that's on my same path that understands what I'm going through. And so a little a little surprise there um, with a new community and maybe not the community that I thought I would have at this point in my life, but definitely a community that I am leaning into and trying to get as much out of as I can and as much support as I can. So 
sobriety is going really well for me. It's it's great. I don't have to worry about um, waking up with uh, hangovers anymore. I don't have to worry about what I did the night before. I don't have to worry if I blacked out. Uh, I don't have to spend as much money. One of the listener questions, I guess we'll just get right into it, is, you know, how does Sober October apply to your finances? And I have this app called I Am Sober. And it's not like perfect or anything. And I just inputted the yes, the guesstimations um, like six dollars a day, four days a week. And I made that estimation based off of like just one beer here is around six dollars in Colorado. And so I can see how much money I've saved this month. And it's been pretty eye opening, to be honest. Um, And now I'm not not drinking fancy drinks when I go out. So there are a lot of non-alcoholic beer options, especially with the craft brewery. brewery. I can never say that word right. Brewery scene out here. (laughs) So it is a little less expensive, um, but I'm still getting drinks when I go out. They just don't have any alcohol in them. Uh, so, but the financial impact has been palpable, I think, um, because while I'm not drinking as much, neither is Joe. He still drinks. Um, we still have that kegerator in our garage, but it's like separate and he keeps all of his alcohol in there and I don't go out there. I don't touch it. So, um, he still partakes, but I have saved according to this calculator, $288 in 48 days. And that's, you know, just on a guess. But, you know, the amount of alcohol or the amount of money I used to spend on alcohol was crazy. And it's always been that way, to be honest. Um, In my undergrad, I mean, we would spend at least three hundred dollars a month on just beer. And that was on a low, low end. Um, So the, the financial impact has been very palpable. And I definitely uh recommend if if you're kind of flirting with the idea of sobriety or or sober curious, you know, track your expenses. I always recommend tracking your expenses anyway, but um, there is nothing like hard data in your hands to make fully thought out decisions. So track, you know, maybe in in October starting now or in November, track how much money you spend on alcohol. And does that align with your values? Does that align with how you want your life to be? Do you think you need to take a break? you know, just based off of the numbers. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's sober October for me. That is my financial takeaway from that. (laughs) Uh, The next listener question, which I get this quite a lot, uh, I guess it's no surprise because I'm very open about my sexuality and my relationships and all that jazz. But uh, do you have an OnlyFans? No, I do not have an OnlyFans. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, I thought about it especially during the pandemic. Uh, But no, I do not have one and I do not see that in the future. Uh, So sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, (laughs) What's the hardest part about being in the debt free community, personal finance community for you? Comparison. Comparison is the most difficult part. I don't think many people really understand the origins of the debt free community. But in 2016, I decided that I could no longer live paycheck to paycheck. I couldn't, you know, be an ostrich. I think that's the the phrase with my head in the sand. You know, I had to take my finances by the horns, essentially. And when I decided that, I just hopped on Instagram and I made an account. And that was that. I started finding people that were doing the same thing, becoming debt free. And It was mostly, I would argue, if not all Dave Ramsey, but it was just people. There were no brands. There were no sponsorships. There were no courses and workbooks and products. Uh, It wasn't like it is now. And I'm not saying that all of that is a bad thing. I'm just saying that it is a very, very different landscape. And I am one of those people now. I'm a thought leader. I was here in the very beginning when, you know, personal finance blew up on Instagram. And it's been interesting to watch that and be a part of that new, I guess, ground. But with that comes a lot of success for different people for many different reasons. 
And I often sit back and say, wow, you know, (laughs) I've been doing this for almost eight years. I'm, I'm closing in on a decade of being in this space, which is wild and makes me feel so old. But I'm closing in on that. And I'm like, why am I not X? Why am I not here? Why don't I have 500,000 followers and a book deal and all these sponsorships and, 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 and especially when I also create content for my main job, which is weird digital marketing. I create content for content creators and I have for four years. So I see the insides. I see the ins and outs of this industry. I see what it takes to get to the top. I've seen things you would not believe, (laughs) but it, it always just hits me. And the comparison is very difficult. You know, why am I not making $10,000 a month? Why am I not making more money? (laughs) Why don't I have all these things? But I think that's human nature. And I am really lucky to have the support system that I have. I am lucky that I have people in my life to say, hey, here's a reality check. You know, you're doing great. You're doing fine. You're 31. You have won awards. You've been impressed. You've run a business through a pandemic and you're still standing. You help people every day. And I have to remind myself of that constantly. So with evolution comes growing pains. And that's definitely one that I have to wrestle with. And I have for a very long time. You know, I I am only human. And I think it's also important to say that, you know, you can have everything that I have and still have depression and still have anxiety and still have all these things that affect you outside of these pixels that we run our businesses on or that we consume content on. If you are a consumer of personal finance content, Um, you know, everything can look great, but underneath the surface, you can be drowning. And I think social media has done a wonderful job of hiding the realities of what it is to be a human while also working to bring that humanity to the forefront. Like I said, duality. And I think, being in the social media space for as long as I've been and studying it in college. I mean, this is the only thing that I've done. I, (laughs) I declared a communications major in 2011, my entire adult life. I have been working in marketing and calm and social media, the digital space. Um, And it's, it's done a great job of kind of hiding the, the negative, but I have to remember everything that I bring to the space. I have to remember who I am and to stay in my own lane. And so if you're struggling with comparison, I, I'm right with you. You know, it it doesn't just stop at a certain point in your life. It's, it's a very human thing to feel. So that is the hardest part of what I do. The next question is how the fuck do I get passive money? So I'm not a slave to my freaking job which pays pretty well, but takes a dump on all of us employees. Well, there is no such thing as passive income. There's no such thing as passive money. I am sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but that's a load of bullshit. Most of this passive income crap is because it is search engine optimized and because you're going to click on that piece of content because you're like, well, how the fuck do I get passive income so I'm not a slave to my freaking job? (laughs) What I will say is that if you want to make money in a more passive way, you have to have time. There is no get rich quick, get out of my job quick situation when it comes to passive income. I see these things all the time. Start a blog, start a blog, just start a blog. I'm making 100K a year with my blog. And it's like, okay, cool. Let's talk about the reality of that. How long did it take you to get there? How long? Five years? You need to be upfront about that. How many people do you hire today to run that blog? How much are your taxes? What's your overhead? These are things that people don't talk about. And they don't talk about it because it's not as snackable. It's not as clickbaity. It's not going to get the traffic they need to make that money off of you. (laughs) So when you're looking at passive income, you have to understand the time sink that you're going to 
have. You're going to have to understand what does it even take to make that money? Like, how much am I going to have to invest so that eventually it is passive income? I see this with YouTube. I see this with real estate. I see it all day long. Now, you can go ahead and make printables and start an Etsy, but Etsy is super saturated. So you're going to have to do more market research and see, is Etsy really worth it or should I go elsewhere? Nothing is passive, friends. Now, you can look at other job opportunities. I think the statistic is you get a 10 to 12% raise every time you move companies or, or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But you get a raise um, usually if you move companies because that's what millennials have been doing for the past decade. Is, you know, we're unhappy with our jobs. We're not being paid well enough. Well, we're going to go into the job market and we're going to get a new job and that's going to come with a pay raise. And learning how to negotiate that, learning how to make a resume, learning how to leverage your skills. Um, but unfortunately, passive income is just something that doesn't exist. Uh, it, it's just marketing. <laughs> so sorry to burst your bubble, but I really hope that you either audit yourself and see, you know, this is a job that I'm going to deal with because it does pay pretty well. and I can withstand the dumpage of uh, management on employees or you're gonna be like oh, fuck this shit i can't stand this i'm gonna go and just whoop, get out of there so those are those are your two options and i'm not saying that you can't work on more passive income just understand what you're getting into so next question is i got nine thousand dollars for a settlement only debt is 3400 car loan any suggestions on what to do with it yeah pay off your car loan um if the interest rate is over, I would say 7%. I don't know uh, if that's something that is right now in, in this current market. Um, maybe it depends on your uh, credit score. But if you have, um, I would say like a 2 or 3% car loan, like I would just continue paying that off monthly. Um, but if it's, it's higher than that, and if you're like, I hate debt, I hate having this on me, then get rid of it. And then stick the rest of it in a high yield savings account if you do not have an emergency fund. If you do have an emergency fund, I would split it in half, the remaining, and I would put one half in a high yield savings account and I would put another half in a Roth IRA. I would probably purchase VTI. As a reminder, I am not an investing expert. I am not a CPA. I am not an AFP, blah, 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 all the certificates. This is just what I would do with my own money if this were me. So yeah, uh, if you hate that car loan and if it's high interest, I would get rid of it. Then I would split the remaining, um, put half of it in a high yield savings account, put the other half in a Roth IRA. Next question is tips as a small business owner as the economy slows. Oh, Lord. Ooh, yeah. Um, so I'm actually going through this right now with my company. Um, and I do have a few tips. So number one is reach out to your circle. I was fortunate enough and I am fortunate enough to know small business owners and a few of them I really, really trust with sensitive information, with my emotions concerning the slowdown of the economy, with ideas. Um, and we really piggyback off of each other and we're able to support each other when things are pretty bad. So maybe set up a meeting with somebody who is in your space, who you trust, who you know isn't going to run their mouth about what's going on in your business. And see what they're doing, see if they have any advice, et cetera. The next thing you're gonna do is go through your expenses. Uh, just like with a personal budget, you're gonna go through your transactions in your bank account for your small business. My business partner and I were able to shave off a considerable amount of money just by looking at subscriptions we didn't need anymore, services we didn't need anymore, random charges that we questioned, um, and deciding, like, ah, do we really need to pay for this or can we do this on our own? Um, so that's the second thing you're going to do. Third thing you're going to do is look back at your old clients. Is there anybody that you can email saying, hey, you know, it's the end of the year. We are looking to bring on new or old faces to our client roster. Um, you know, don't forget about us. You know, we're here to make your life easier. Here's our new services. X. It's never a bad idea to kind of dip back into where you came from, especially if you like your past clients. You don't know what they've got going on. They may need services again. They may need 
projects taken care of that are random but could generate some income for you. So those are the three things that I'm doing in my own small business as the economy slows. Um, you know, my husband is a bartender and we're going into the winter months in Colorado, which means we are and we're not near a ski town. <laughs> That's a caveat. Uh, so our income is definitely going to take a dip and a pretty hard dip. And so these are things that I'm actively doing right now. And the last question I have is, what's your favorite part uh, about Halloween? Uh, I love Halloween. Halloween is my favorite time of year. It's my favorite holiday. Um, if you're new here or if you don't know, I am a practicing witch, which, you know, <laughs> it's, there's a lot of information out there that is incorrect. Um, so take that for what you take it for. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I am a pagan. I'm a practicing witch. Um, and so October and specifically Halloween or Samhain is our witch's new year. So this time of year is very important for my religion. And outside of my religion, it's just it's Colorado is top notch in October. I mean, there is so much to do here. We have the pumpkin patches, the apple orchards, everybody everywhere is serving all this autumnal food. It gets crisp and cold outside. We usually have our first snowfall in October. It just feels like a different energy. It feels revitalizing to me. And so this time of year is truly my favorite period. Um, and it's a time where I really reflect on the year prior and I think of what I really want to accomplish in the new year. I take time to kind of nurse my spiritual self. And I don't know. I, I, Halloween is my favorite part of Halloween, honestly. <laughs> But I guess my top three are um, spooky movies uh, and shows. You know, Mike Flanagan just released Fall of the House of Usher, which is phenomenal. Uh, he is the director that did The Haunting of Hill House, Bly Manor, Midnight Mass. And I, those are the three I think most popular. But now he's doing it, you know, every October. And it's something I look forward to every year. Um, grab your emotional support. Uh, husband, wife, partner, animal blanket, because uh, it is scary as fuck. Um, so yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of Halloween. Two would be the apple cider donuts, uh, because they are delicious and I love them. And then number three would probably just be the temperature change. Like um, I am somebody that gets like reverse seasonal depression. Uh, I'm not happy in the summer. I I loathe the summer now, which is funny because I grew up on the beach, and I used to be like this big beach bum. Uh, now I'm like, give me the snow, <laughs> give me the cold. Um, we're starting to get into thirties and twenties at night here. Uh, so it's just uh, sweater weather. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's my favorite, my three favorite parts of Halloween. But I hope you enjoyed this little episode. Uh, you know, I like doing, um, more lighthearted episodes in between the factual or the emotionally heavy episodes. I think it's a good balance for, well, for myself, creating content and for listeners, you know, I if you want a really heavy hitting podcast, um, I think that we can accomplish that. But I also want to inject personality and who I am and my life into here, because, I mean, that's the point. <laughs> it's my podcast and I can do what I want. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, let me know how you enjoyed this episode. I also frequently put up, I think every Friday, I put up little ask me anything boxes in my Instagram stories, my little anonymous uh, question box. And I will probably do these uh, every now and then questions that uh, you want answered um, in an effort to get people to listen to the podcast and just answer your questions. So, all right. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I will talk to you next week. We'll be talking about uh, unethical behavior in nonprofit organizations and charity scams. So that will be fun. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of For Fox Sake. If you want more content like this, follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at VFrugalFox. And don't be a stranger. I respond to followers and love feedback from my community. If you want to make my day and help this podcast reach more people, please consider giving a review wherever you listen to your podcast. A special thanks to Kaylee Johnson, Heather Devoki, and Joseph Bocco. See you next week. And remember, do it with an open heart and no attachment to the results.